All right. So I am going to start <clears throat> by telling you a bit about a person named Bill Rogers. Was that entire opening muted? <laughs> Sorry, Susan. I, I, <laughs> mute, I, I didn't realize At it least would mute. I didn't I get didn't, any further into it. I didn't it. realize it would mute you. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, I'll start by saying that, you know, a lot of people, when they write their first novel, they, they wind up mining material from their childhood. And in my first novel, I was actually working with life experience from my 20s. It was a very influential time in my life, a very formative time. I attended a school called Prescott College and it's Prescott College for the Liberal Arts in the Environment. So no matter what it is that you're studying at Prescott College, no matter what it is your major is, you also study how that field or issue relates to the environment and to the natural world. And so, you know, I studied creative writing there and was very oriented towards, you know, how can writing make a difference? How, how can, you know, my creative practice, you know, both bear witness to the natural world, be a witness to history? How can I engage? And there are a lot of other young people living in uh, Prescott at the time who stayed after graduation. And there was a very strong community at that time in my life of artists and activists and people really dedicated to the environmental struggle, to sustainable living, and in many ways to forging community-based alternatives to kind of a traditional American consumerist, capitalist sort of life. And one of the people kind of at the heart of our community was a guy named Bill Rogers. Bill Rogers was a graduate of Prescott College, my, my alma mater, the same school, uh, from the 80s. And he, uh, I knew, had lived up in the Northwest in Eugene um, for much of the 90s. But he came back to Prescott in the middle of the aughts and started uh, what is known as an info shop. So this is a kind of a community center of a punk activist bent. And uh, some of you may have been in such spaces. I'm sure many of you have not, but you know, it was a place that you would kind of wander, wander into and go, what, what is this place? There would be racks of zines, you know, on every subject imaginable from like bike repair to seed saving to, you know, resisting fascism. Um, there were bands that would play there often for free. There was a free school where anybody could um, teach about any skill that they had, anything that they knew uh, to others. It was a very vibrant, beautiful place. Musicians and circus performers on tour would often play there and pass the hat. Um, you never know who you would see or, or what kind of you know, uh, offerings you would find there on the weekends or um, even at just random times. But at the heart of this info shop, was an environmental struggle, it was a particular struggle, which was the fight to get Peabody coal off of uh, Diné land, off of uh, the Navajo um, reservation uh, up at Black Mesa, where this coal company had been using just gargantuan amounts of water um, in this dry, dry land from the Navajo Aquifer to process their coal slurry with very little economic benefit uh, to the native folks there. And traditional elders had been resisting the, this uh, company forever. Uh, but 
the Black Cat, Bill Rogers had formed it in particular to have a base for activism in, you know, a, a near, relatively nearby city in Prescott. And, you know, and to build support for that movement for the Native activists up there. And in many ways he did. They man finally managed to kick Peabody Quill out of there um, in the aughts. But then they kind of geared up for another fight. Um, and that one was to save the last free flowing river in the state of Arizona, which is the Verde River. And um, that fight is ongoing. So that's just to give you some background, you know, on who Bill was uh, to me and to all of us and just an inspiring figure and somebody really engaged. Um, and then word came that the FBI had raided the black cat and a ripple kind of went through our community. And that ripple turned into a shock about two days later when we find out, found out that Bill had died. Bill had committed suicide in uh, police custody. And it was clear he had been prepared to do that. Um, should he be taken in? And that was when we found out that Bill Rogers was actually had been on the FBI's most wanted list uh, for about a decade. He had gone by the name uh, Avalon. He was part of a group of people called the family, which is a group of so-called eco-terrorists. Their crimes were crimes of property, not of crimes against human beings. But they had set fire to about $12 million dollars worth of property. We're talking ski resorts, meat packing plants, animal testing facilities, construction offices. This group of people, these radical activists that he had been a part of in Eugene, they had taken direct action all the way to that extreme. And one by one, they had all kind of folded on each other. And he had actually come to Prescott to on the run. Um, and he was one of the last ones to be taken in and everybody else had is serving life sentences in custody and he was clearly unprepared to do that. So he made this decision instead. So you can imagine, you can imagine what this meant to all of us that young people that he had galvanized to take action on these environmental issues, these local struggles. and. To me, you know, the questions that his life and legacy brought up to me were questions like, what do you do once you know the wrong that's being done? What do you do? Two, how far are you personally willing to go to make a difference? Where is your line? You know, he clearly had no line. You know, for him, it was everything. It was his whole life. He gave his life to the struggle. But then three, and this is a really important one for me, what is skillful means? What is effective action versus action to for the sake of action, action to make you feel like you're doing something? What is the action that is actually going to be effective in making a difference in these things that you care about? Um, and those are all questions that I explore in my first novel, Hot Season. Um, you know, the, the character of Dyson Lathe is based on Bill Rogers. And the book, you know, is the story of three young women, all from various different backgrounds, all students at a college based on Prescott College, who are all involved in the fight to save a local river, and who have to answer these questions for themselves of how far they're willing to go in this struggle and what they consider a meaningful action and effective action. So that is one of the ways that I have paid tribute to Bill and his legacy in my life. So that's one person who was a friend. Um, I'll go on to talk about now Ursula K. Le Guin, who is, I met her once or twice, but more than anything, she is 
an author who has had an influence on me. More than anything, she is a leader in my industry, so to speak, to, you know, to use that kind of jargon. Um, and when I was a kid, um, the Earthsea books were very important to me. And um, some of you here may remember that there was a time when we had this kind of book of the month clubs where they would start off where you could, you know, flip through this catalog of titles and pick 20 titles for a penny a piece, right? Which was just the smoking deal. But then thereafter, you know, you had, they would send you a title each month and you had to pay full price or send it back, right? And of course, nobody had the time, you know, or attention to send it back. So my folks were members of the Sci-Fi and Fantasy Book Club. And when I started reading, you know, real books, I had an entire shelf of fantasy and science fiction to consume. And that it was such a fabulous education in speculative fiction. But I was really um, taken as a kid with these three books. And, you know, I love these particular, um, this edition of them because these, these covers I think are really iconic. Um, but I didn't quite understand the full range of Le Guin's, of Ursula K. Le Guin's artistry until I came to Portland. Um, and that was when I began to read books like The Left Hand of Darkness. It's when I read The Dispossessed, you know, and I know um, that some of you have, have read these books too, and, and you've also been um, blown away by Le Guin's artistry because I think she's one of the finest writers not only the Northwest has ever produced, but that this country has ever produced. And those Earthsea books appealed to me as a kid. I think the way, the reason that they do to so many like young writers, people who will grow up to be writers, because at the heart of them is a magic system based on words. And that so speaks to the, the truth of our world. Words are magic. Words do make physical things happen. Words cause people to move, move them to action. Words are magic, you know? Um, and, you know, I mentioned that book of the month club. I mentioned that shelf of fantasy and science fiction where I discovered writers like Jane Yolen and Anne McCaffrey and, Ray Bradbury and Stephen R. Donaldson and, and all these amazing voices. And I had assumed that these Earthsea books were part of that same club. But I found out later, after Le Guin had become my favorite author, after I'd read a vast amount, vastly more amount of her work after I moved to Portland, I found out that my mother had actually read the Earthsea books when she was pregnant with me, you know? So you could say that her work has always been with me. Um, and, and I mean, how do you even count the legacy of that? But I know, you know, when I moved to Portland, the city is home to so many famous names, so many literary luminaries. But when I moved there in 2009, no one's name loomed larger than that of Ursula K. Le Guin. In her environmentalism, in her commitment to pacifism, in her exploration of anarchist thought, in her exploration of what we might now call, you know, think of as queer identities, in her, you know, resistance to fascism and, and and engagement with issues of racism, sexism, colonialism, and slavery. Like nobody more seemed to embody the spirit of the city at that time than her. And that's when I started to discover her science fiction. The Left Hand of Darkness 
absolutely blew me away with its exploration of this planet where people uh, are of indeterminate gender until they go into what's called Kemmer or a kind of heat, you know, um, and, and the, the culture clash between someone from earth, you know, trying to build an alliance with somebody from this planet of Gethin and the, all the miscalculations and misunderstandings that they make, you know, the dispossessed, the story of a, of a anarchist movement that was exiled to the moon uh, of a capitalist planet, Urus, and then this kind of cultural, this goodwill mission after years of separation is kind of like stranger in a strange land for those of you who, who've read the Heinlein, but, you know, in this way that deeply explores the values at the heart of, of different types of, you know, these philosophies of capitalism and, and anarchy, you know, and then after I read those books, I thought, well, all of her work can't possibly be that good, can it? So, you know, I went to Powell's and got, you know, there was only one, a few other books of hers um, as stocked at that time. And they had these really cheesy YA covers. These were gifts, powers, and voices. And damned if they weren't all that good. They were just fantastic. Every single one of them. This woman published like, I mean, like close to 35 book, like just works of fiction. That's not even all of her essays and translations and, and works of poetry. And, you know, at the heart of them, I really just found a model, frankly, because when I was, I went to, I moved to Portland to, um, get my MFA. And in the course of my MFA program, you know, I really kind of received this kind of tacit um, message that politics was not the province of art. It was not the province of literature. This was, you should not be thinking in terms of social issues. You know, if that was in the periphery, that was okay, but it, it shouldn't be the focus of your work. Because if you, if you did that sort of thing, it was going to come off as didactic and 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 flat, you know, and also, you know, I um, I really felt like she gave me permission to do that, and the understanding that writing a in this very direct way about the things that mattered most to me as somebody with an activist substrate foundation to my life you know I could do that and still make it as good as any art you know because that is what she did to my mind her work is absolutely top shelf literature you know her hero in life was Virginia Woolf and yet there's no mincing about the way that she engaged with issues in her work um so, and I know some of you saw her 2015 National Book Award speech, which went viral, you know, where she said, let's see if I can get this quote, we live in capitalism and its power seems inevitable, but so did the divine right of kings. Any power established by human beings can be changed by human beings. I mean, just that speech, what a legacy to leave, right? So when she passed in uh, 2017, I knew that I had to do something to pay tribute to her because, you know, Le Guin warned us pretty clearly um, in her book, The Wave and the Mind. Um, she said, the denigration, omission, and exception the female writer faces during her lifetime are only preparations for her disappearance after her death. I heard her share those words on a podcast with David Naiman, and they, they raised the hair on the back of my neck. And so when she passed, you know, they came back to me in an echo, and I said, I'd be damned if I allow that to happen. With whatever small measure of power I have, I will put a brick in the wall to shore up the great woman's legacy. So 
you know, I um, conceived of this anthology, Dispatches from Anaris, Tales in Tribute to Ursula K. Le Guin, in which I pulled together, um, you know, short fiction written by um, writers from Le Guin's hometown or hometown of nearly 50 years, Portland, Oregon, in tribute to her and really did it as a labor of love and with a lot of meticulous care in terms of speaking to all the various um, core threads, let's say, or themes in her work. Uh, so if you if you love her work as well, I hope that you will pick up that anthology. Um, and I hope that that anthology, you know, if you've never read Le Guin's work, I hope that inspires you to read some of her work. So again, not somebody I knew, not somebody I'm related to, but somebody who's had a huge influence on my life is Ursula K. Le Guin. So I'm going to conclude by, oh, and you know, if I was going to summarize her influence on my life, I would say Le Guin inspired me to write as well as I possibly can about the most pressing issues of our day. So finally, I'm going to share a little bit with you about my grandmother, one of my grandmothers, uh, Priscilla Gautier de Freitas. This woman was born in 1918 in Guyana, South America, which is the only English speaking country in South America. So uh, Guyanese English sounds like Caribbean English, uh, in case you are wondering. Most, most people are not familiar with, with, with where this is in the world. Um, her father was a French engineer and a person of privilege in Guyana, he established the first um, refrigeration plant um, in that time, which as you imagine, you know, in a country directly on the equator gave him a lot of power. Um, but he married a, a woman of East Indian descent um, who had been adopted by a European family. And so she had been raised as a lady, she had been raised as privileged but she was an Indian person, a brown-skinned person. Um, and so my grandmother was a child of privilege, but she was also a child of mixed race. Uh, they had to, she had to go to a special school because of uh, the schools for uh, European children, white children, she was not allowed to attend. Um, but, you know, she grew up taking the the tram cars through uh georgetown the capital she grew up in a big house she grew up with servants and then her father died and uh my great-grandmother was a spendthrift she was a good time gal she was known for you know all the houses in guyana are up on stilts because the the country is prone prone to flooding she was known for throwing parties for all sorts of, you know, itinerant uh, musicians and, and folks who were homeless underneath the house, uh, you know, during the day. And when her, her French husband would get home, she would clear them off all of a sudden, try to hide it. So anyways, when he passed, she spent the fortune. She spent all the money. And so she and my grandmother had to go live with uh, my great grandmother's Indian family, which um, lived in a place called Laguan. And they lived a very traditional uh, Indian lifestyle in a big compound situated around rice paddies with all the families, you know, a son would marry and bring his wife. They would just add another room onto this compound. And my grandmother actually wrote a memoir. Um, it, it's like in the autobiography style, it's her whole life. And it was so amazing to, to me to read about this time in her life. You know, the beauty of the natural world, the beauty of working in community. She learned to cook from her own grandmother. She learned to, to raise a garden, you know, to save seeds, to, to farm, to make a living. But she was also married off at the age of 14 because that was how that was their tradition. And so she had her first child at 15 
she had very little control over her life. Her, her husband beat her um, or was very jealous a lot of the time. And then her mother, a very strong-willed person, basically just came and took her and her young son back and then tried to remarry her to someone else. And my grandmother's first great act of rebellion was choosing not to do that. She chose to marry the guy next door, a Portuguese guy who was my grandfather, Poppy. And over the course of my grandmother's life, she first taught herself how to sew, learned to make clothes, made clothing for a local department store. Then they, you know, she grew a garden, she raised food, she sold produce, she kept livestock, they bred livestock, she sold the animals. My grandfather worked at the sugar estate and they, they saved their money. They opened a general store by the end, by the time revolution came in the, in the sixties, there was a beer garden. She became a prosperous middle-class person with no, no backing help or support um, in a very poor place. And she used her own education. Uh, you know, she had had that little bit of schooling before her father passed to educate my dad and my aunt. And as a consequence, they were both able to, my dad became an engineer, my aunt became a, a nurse, they both moved to the US and they were able to sponsor my grandparents in moving here as well at a time when the, the bottom just fell out of the economy in Guyana. So her legacy is complex. And you know, someone here spoke to the legacy of trauma. She was a person who was very traumatized by the life that she led. And she passed that on to my dad, you know, and he still has that trauma. Uh, but she also passed on all of these beautiful things to me. And I would say her legacy in my life is one of self-determination. And it's also, you know, she's the reason I'm an entrepreneur as a book coach and an editor, but she's also the reason I'm an artist because she was just as creative. You know, she had that natural bent as a writer, but she never had the margin to do anything with it in her life because she, she did not have the kind of freedoms that I did. So this has been, you know, kind of just a little bit of a whirlwind tour, you know, of three people who've had a huge influence in my life. But I hope that in, in sharing the stories of these three people out to you, that you actually now understand me in a way that, you know, if we had just been sitting here having small talk for the last, you know, half hour or so, you would never, never have gotten. Okay. So um, I want to open this up for Q and A and thank you, Russell, for reminding me that I, I get a little a garrulous when I start to talk about people who've been important to me in my life. Just any thoughts that you might have or questions. Uh, 